For a hundred years, steam locomotives ruled the American rails. So when a bold new diesel roared to life in 1939, railroad veterans openly scoffed, calling it noisy, flimsy, and doomed to fail. But behind the laughter, something unprecedented was beginning. A 1,350 horsepower machine, purpose-built to dethrone steam, would embark on an 83,764-mile odyssey across 35 railroads, shattering every assumption. How did a mocked outsider become the engine that outlasted them all? And what did it cost to rewrite a century of tradition? For generations, the sound of steam was the heartbeat of American railroads. From the 1830s through the 1930s, nearly every locomotive that thundered down the tracks ran on coal and water, their whistles echoing across the continent. By 1916, steam engines hauled more than three quarters of all inner city freight ton miles in the United States. The entire industry had grown up around these iron giants. Coaling towers, water tanks, ash pits, and roundhouses dotted the landscape every hundred miles or so. Crews took pride in their craft, tending fires, managing boiler pressure, and coaxing maximum power from machines that seemed as alive as the men who ran them. Inside the cab, a veteran engineer could sense every quiver and groan of his locomotive. He knew the rhythm of stoking the firebox, the art of nursing a boiler through a winter night, and the teamwork required to keep a train rolling mile after mile. For many, being a steam engineer was more than a job. It was an identity, passed down through families and forged in the heat of the firebox. The railroad press reflected this confidence. In 1939, editorials in Railway Age and Railway Mechanical Engineer questioned whether diesel engines could ever be trusted with heavy freight. The consensus was clear. Diesels were for switching yards or lightweight passenger trains, not for the grueling work of hauling tonnage over mountains and through deserts. Skepticism ran deep, and it was not just about technology. Billions of dollars had been poured into steam infrastructure. Entire towns depended on the steady work of maintaining boilers, cleaning grates, and servicing running gear. The idea that all of this could be swept aside by a machine powered by oil and electricity felt not just unlikely, but almost disrespectful to a century of hard-won tradition. Stories circulated among crews about early diesels being little more than overgrown toys, tin cans on wheels, some called them, or boxcars with motors. The distinctive rattle and clatter of a diesel engine was a far cry from the deep, measured chuff of steam. For many, the new sound was an insult to the railroad's heritage. In union halls and division offices, old-timers scoffed at the notion that a 1,350 horsepower diesel could replace a pair of massive 2102 locomotives or 484 locomotives. To them, the FT looked like an experiment, not a serious rival. Yet behind the scenes, a sense of unease was growing. The world was changing fast, and the pressure to move more freight, faster, and cheaper was building. Some managers began to wonder if the old ways would be enough. But for most, the weight of tradition was hard to ignore. The challenge for any newcomer was not just technical, it was cultural. To unseat steam would require more than a new machine. It would take proof, delivered on the rails mile after mile, in the only language railroaders trusted, performance. Inside the General Motors labs at LaGrange, Illinois, a team of engineers set out to build something no one had ever seen before a diesel-electric locomotive powerful enough to haul the heaviest freight trains in America. The heart of their creation was the new 1657 engine, a two-stroke 16-cylinder powerhouse that delivered 1,350 horsepower per unit, more than 10 times the output of the earliest diesels. But horsepower on paper was not enough. The railroad world demanded proof not promises. The engineers assembled their prototype, designated EMC-103, in a configuration that would become legendary, ABBA. That meant two cab units and two booster units, 
coupled together into a single seamless locomotive set. Together, these four units delivered a combined 5,400 horsepower, enough in theory to match or surpass the biggest steam engines then in service. The design allowed all four units to be operated from a single cab, a concept called multiple unit control. For the first time, a railroad could scale its motive power to the weight of the train simply by adding or removing units without the complexity of double-heading steam. But none of this would matter if the FT could not perform on the rails. In November 1939, EMC 103 rolled out of LaGrange and began a demonstration tour unlike anything the industry had seen. Over the next 11 months, the FT would cover 83,764 miles, more than three times around the globe, hauling real revenue freight across 35 different railroads. The itinerary read like a who is who of American railroading, Santa Fe, Great Northern, Northern Pacific, Milwaukee Road, Denver, and Rio Grande Western, Western Pacific, and many more. The FT tackled deserts, mountains, and winter storms, pulling heavy loads over passes that had humbled. The best steam had to offer. EMD sent its own technicians along for every mile, logging performance data, fuel consumption, and maintenance needs. On the Santa Fe in January 1940, the demonstrator ran 12,871 miles in just 32 days, besting the schedules of nearly new 2104 steam locomotives over the Tehachapi Mountains and cutting running time by 45 minutes. In Montana, the FT climbed the steep grades of Bozeman Hill with a 17-car passenger train and a dynamometer car, recording every pound of pull and every minute of running time. On the Burlington, it racked up nearly 4,000 miles in just 10 days, impressing managers even as new 484 steam engines rolled out of the shops. At every stop, skeptics watched closely. Some expected the diesel to falter on long grades or break down far from home. Instead, the FT kept running day after day with only routine inspections. The tour was not just a publicity stunt. It was a trial by fire designed to answer every doubt with hard evidence, mile by mile. By the time EMC 103 completed its journey, the numbers spoke for themselves. The FT had proven it could match the power and endurance of steam, not just in the lab, but on the rails where it counted most. Railroad management faced a dilemma that went far beyond horsepower or reliability charts. By 1939, the entire industry was bound to steam by more than habit. Decades of investment had built an empire of coal chutes, water towers, and roundhouses, each one a monument to the age of steam. Every division point was a small city of skilled hands, boilermakers, machinists, firemen, whose livelihoods depended on the constant care and feeding of coal-fired giants. The arrival of a diesel-electric engine threatened not just a machine, but a way of life. In the shops, foremen eyed the FT with suspicion. The new locomotive ran on oil, not coal, and needed no firemen to shovel fuel or tend a boiler. Shopmen wondered what would become of their trades. Honed over years spent crawling inside fireboxes or wrestling with valve gear. A union representative from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and Enginemen voiced what many were thinking. If diesels took over, thousands of firemen would be left without a role. For decades, the union had fought to make sure that every train crew included a fireman, regardless of the engine. Now, with the FT, that tradition seemed to hang by a thread. The resistance was not just about jobs. Railroads had poured billions into steam infrastructure, coaling plants, water towers, and heavy repair shops. Most of these assets still had years of useful life ahead. Switching to diesel would mean writing off entire facilities, stranding investments that had barely been paid off. Executives worried about the cost of building new diesel fueling stations and retraining workers for unfamiliar technology. For every mile of track, there were miles more in pipes, tanks, and pits, all tailored to steam. Steam's inefficiency hid in plain sight. 
Every night, locomotives sat simmering in roundhouses, burning coal just to keep their boilers warm for the morning call. Even when idle, they consumed fuel and manpower. Firemen worked graveyard shifts, banking fires through the night to avoid a cold start at dawn. The cost of this routine added up quickly, but it was so deeply woven into daily operations that few stopped to question it. In the union halls, the debate grew heated. Some argued that diesels were a passing fad, a corporate experiment that would never last. Others saw the writing on the wall and quietly began seeking retraining. The Brotherhood lobbied for rules to keep firemen on diesel runs even if their traditional duties disappeared. Shop workers worried about their future as well. Diesel engines required far less daily attention. No tube cleaning, no ash removal, no endless rounds of lubrication and inspection. For many, the skills that once made them indispensable now seemed at risk of fading into history. Railroad executives facing pressure from shareholders and labor alike hesitated to take the plunge. The FT might prove itself in a test run, but could it really replace steam on a national scale? The numbers from the demonstration tour were impressive, but changing the course of an industry meant confronting not just technical questions, but the deeply rooted interests of an entire workforce. Until the FT could deliver proof in hard data, costs, reliability, and performance, skepticism would hold the upper hand. The challenge was as much about people and sunk costs as it was about machinery. Numbers cut through rumor and tradition like nothing else. The FT demonstration tour produced a mountain of data, charts, logs, and fuel tallies that railroad managers could not ignore. On the Santa Fe, the FT tackled the infamous grades of Kajan Pass and Tehachapi, hauling trains that matched the tonnage of the biggest 2104 steam engines. In side-by-side -side tests, the FT not only kept pace, it often arrived ahead, and it did so without stopping for water or tending a firebox through the night. Maintenance records told a story that no amount of skepticism could dismiss. Steam locomotives required constant attention, boiler washouts, tube cleaning, and endless rounds of lubrication. Every hundred miles or so, a steam engine needed fresh water and coal. And after a few thousand miles, it was back to the shop for heavy repairs. The FT, by contrast, ran thousands of miles between scheduled inspections. Over the course of the 83,764-mile tour, the FT spent just a fraction of its time in the shop. Maintenance logs revealed a stunning figure. Compared to steam, the FT required 92% less time out of service for repairs and routine work. Fuel costs tipped the scales even further. In 1940, coal cost around $2.36 a ton, and a steam engine burned through it whether it was moving or idling overnight. Diesel fuel, by contrast, cost about $0.04 cents a gallon, and the FT engine only ran when needed. No standing fires, no wasted fuel. When the numbers were tallied, the FT delivered a 28% reduction in operating costs per mile. For railroads operating on thin margins, this was more than a technical curiosity. It was a path to survival. Santa Fe's mechanical officers, once among the most vocal doubters, began to reconsider. After seeing the FT handle desert freights without a single water stop and watching shop crews finish routine checks in hours instead of days, the mood in the boardroom shifted. One officer, who had spent his career defending steam, admitted privately that the data left little room for argument. The FT had matched steam's power over the worst grades, run longer between breakdowns, runs and slashed maintenance costs to a level no one thought possible. These results were not confined to a single railroad or a handful of easy runs. The FT repeated its performance across 35 different railroads in every kind of weather and terrain. The numbers were consistent. Less time in the shop, fewer breakdowns, and real savings on every mile. For railroad executives, the question was no longer whether the FT could replace steam, but how quickly they could make the switch. Proof 
had arrived, not in promises or marketing, but in cold, hard figures that changed the course of American railroading. War changed everything. In 1942, as the United States poured resources into the fight overseas, the War Production Board took direct control of locomotive manufacturing. Steam builders were ordered to keep producing what they knew. But General Motors' Electromotive Division, with its unique 567 diesel engine already powering Navy vessels, received a rare green light to keep building FTs for the railroads. Wartime demand for freight reached levels no one had seen before and the government needed locomotives that could haul more tonnage, run longer between stops, and free up manpower for the front lines. The FT's record during the demonstration tour had already caught the attention of planners in Washington. Now, the War Production Board began allocating diesel units where they would make the biggest impact. Santa Fe, with its long desert stretches and water shortages, received the largest share. Other major carriers followed, each one handed a slice of the limited production. Between 1939 and 1945, 1,096 FT units rolled out of LaGrange, each one destined for the hardest working freight routes in America. A wartime historian later described this moment as a turning point, not just for technology, but for the entire industry. The FT became more than a locomotive. It was a strategic asset its allocation determined by government decree. Wartime urgency forced the railroad's hand. Technical arguments and old loyalties faded in the face of national need. The diesel was no longer a curiosity. It was essential. The numbers told the story. More freight moved, fewer breakdowns, and a new standard set by a machine that began as an outsider. By the late 1940s, a quiet revolution was underway on America's railroads. Orders for EMD diesels soared as soon as wartime controls lifted. Railroads that had once championed steam now lined up for the FT and its successors, eager to retire their aging fleets. General Motors' LaGrange plant ran at full tilt, shipping hundreds of new units each year. The FT's 16-cylinder 567 engine became the backbone of the entire F-unit family. The F2, F3, and F7 units, machines that would dominate freight service for the next two decades. The numbers tell the story. Between 1945 and 1955, railroads placed some of the largest equipment orders in history, snapping up thousands of F-units to replace nearly every mainline steam locomotive. By 1950, diesels handled more than half the nation's freight miles. Just a decade later, the sight of a steam engine on a major railroad had become a rarity. By 1960, almost every steam locomotive in the United States had been scrapped or retired, many with years of service left on their clocks. The FT's legacy reached far beyond its own production run. Its engine design, modular construction, and multiple unit control shaped the next generation of diesel power. The same basic 567 engine kept working, rebuilt, upgraded, and repurposed, long after the last FT left the rails. What began as an experiment doubted by nearly everyone in the business ended up outlasting and outworking the very machines it was meant to replace. Diesel power now moves over 99% of all U.S. rail freight, a legacy built on the EMD-FT's disruption. Progress rarely sounds familiar at first. Today, as new technologies challenge old industries, the lesson endures. Skepticism is always loudest just before the world changes. The future belongs to those willing to listen beyond the noise. What change are you ready to hear?